The following podcast is sponsored by High Beam Ministry. The basic idea is that fewer guns equal less gun crime. But for this theory to have even a chance of working, drastic reductions in the supply of guns will be necessary. Everything else amounts to security theater. The late Senator Howard Metzenbaum, a strong gun control advocate, explained it this way. If you don't ban all guns, you might as well ban none of them. Even putting aside the issue of the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which affirms the right to keep and bear arms, a gun ban has no broad popular support, never mind the conservative states. Handgun ban referendums failed by large margins in two of our most liberal states, Massachusetts in 1976 and California in 1982. No serious attempts have been made since then. Many in legacy media love mass shootings. Now, I'm not saying that you love the tragedy, but I am saying that you love the ratings. Crying white mothers are ratings gold to you and many in the legacy media in the back. And notice I said crying white mothers because there are thousands of grieving black mothers in Chicago every weekend and you don't see town halls for them, do you? Where's the CNN town hall for Chicago? This has been going on for decades now. We've seen a, a steady breakdown, not just of other institutions in, in society like communities, but the family. More and more children are being raised in broken homes. And that's a factor, not just in these extreme cases where you have these incredibly disturbed young men that go on to commit these horrific crimes, but in so many of the other problems that we talk about and deal with, whether that's um, welfare dependency or drug addiction or ways in which the school system isn't working and kids aren't learning and can't get jobs, it all comes back to the family because if every child was raised in a stable, loving home, then so many of the problems that we deal with would actually be solved. Welcome to the Airzats Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your truth barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my website, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H-I-G-H-B-E-A-M ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. Do you know what, Truth Barista? What? I think we're becoming more like the wild, wild west than anything else. Go ahead. Make my day. So I, we had a customer this morning, and he comes in, and he's talking about all the stuff that's going on in the news with the gun control and the, and the massacre that happened down in Florida. And then he opens up this trench coat-like coat, and, and there it is. There's a gun. Just <laughs> Really? He was packing, huh? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you got to pack in a coffee house. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Right. But he was so proud of what he had there with his gun. So what do you think about all this well, stuff? Well, you know, it really doesn't matter what I think about this stuff. It really matters what God thinks about that stuff. Because after all, this is the Truth Barista, right? And we're at the well, There's that right. Coffee Shop here, that's and we right. want to serve up a steaming cup of God's truth for the average Joe. So that's a great discussion point. I really want to talk about this gun. I, I don't know what to respond to people because you got people on both sides of the issue, and let's kind of look at that. Can we? Okay. Okay. Well, let's just make this kind of more impromptu. I mean, okay, usually sure. I have a Bible study prepared, so sure. But let's. Why is gun control so important? Well, it's obvious from what happened in Florida and San. Hook and these other shootings, these mass killings that have taken place that, well, and then look at the murder rate in Chicago and around the United States and many of these cities. Even Minneapolis was called Murderapolis not too long ago because of the killings that were taking place. So it's an important point because guns are a tool that are used to take a human life. Well, in most of these places that you've mentioned, Chicago, Minneapolis, other places, they're very strict gun control. There's laws on the books, but it doesn't seem to help curb. And is that? that interesting? The cities that have oftentimes the highest gun control laws often are the most lawless when it comes to gun use. I find that very uh, ironic, perhaps? You know, back in the 20s, they actually banned, they had laws against alcohol. Right, and so that totally happened? stopped all alcohol consumption, yeah, right? It went all underground and the speakeasies and everything else. It got worse after they put the laws And this in. is what's ironic, because during those days, they had, remember, the Valentine's Day Massacre? 
massacre by the bootleggers? Well, the Parkland shooting took place on Valentine's Day. Wow. Well, I'm not saying that to make a joke out of it, which I'm certainly not. Right. There are many families that were deeply hurt by that and were still feeling the repercussions, but it really started a lot of hysteria over the gun control issue again. And I'm frankly getting kind of tired that anytime something like this happens, we don't look at the people who necessarily did it. We don't look at the failures of the department, various departments, but we start blaming guns as if some Mm -hmm. gun walked into a building and started shooting the place up. You know, but I think we should have a good discussion today about that. Absolutely. And it's the misguided emphasis is what you're talking about. Right. People, they get their emotions all out of whack, and it's just the wrong emphasis. So let's let's put the right emphasis to it. Let's start with this. Let's talk about life, because that's the core issue. If it wasn't about life being taken away or the importance of life, then really the whole gun control issue wouldn't matter. So what about life? Well, what does the Bible say? Well, God cares about life. He created it. He gives it, and he has the right to take it away. Well, doesn't he own everything? Right. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, if you want to put it in New King James Version, which means everything and anything and everybody belongs to him. Why? He created it. He can do with it as he sees fit. He has the last word. That's right. So he gives life in Genesis 2-7 to humanity by breathing life into it. And then he says, if you sin, Genesis <laughs> 10 verses later, he says, and by the way, if you abuse your freedom and sin against me, it's going to be the death penalty. You will surrender your life back to me. Now notice, this is not God's fault that he would take a life. He says, it's your fault if you misuse what I've given you. You then will surrender or forfeit your right to life. See, God always puts the right emphasis. Mm -hmm. Always. It's never skewed some way. He just puts a blame where the blame needs to be placed. And it happened because Adam and Eve, humanity sinned, and therefore death entered the human race. So he removes the life force from the body as part of the punishment. That was the terms, right? So if you disobey God, he's basically saying, you've unplugged yourself from the source of life, therefore you die. It's not on him. As a friend of mine says, you wear this one, right? Good point. Now, as the creator, human life is a primary concern to God. Now, how do we know? Because he's told us throughout scripture. On a kind of a flip side, if you look at the death penalty, if you take a life unjustly, it shows you how important life is to God. If you kill somebody, you yourself surrender your life. That's Leviticus 24, 17. The principle, by the way, that I see in this, which is really awesome, the seriousness of the punishment reflects the seriousness of the crime. So if you do not punish murder in a an appropriate way or at the same just level, then you must not think murder is a very serious crime. And sadly, we see that today. Well, I think Solomon wrote something similar to that in Ecclesiastes where he's talking about that if you don't quickly punish a crime, then that gives people an opportunity to continue that crime unabated. So exactly. I, I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of the idea. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, God says that life is so important to him, he wants us to not just live but have eat eternal life. That's John 3, 16. We've heard that verse repeatedly. But look at John 10. Jesus says, I came not just to give life, but to give them abundant life. God does not want death, nor does he take pleasure in the death of anyone, especially the wicked. And it says in Ezekiel 33, 11, I love this. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. live. There you go. Okay, so let's talk about taking a human life. Now, since God was the creator, he has the right to demand a life back. So God removes a life because of evil, and that's based on actions. Follow me? Mm -hmm. Adam did not die. He did not surrender his life until he committed the actions. Ezekiel 18.20 says, the soul that sins shall die. Numbers 35 says, but if he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. It says further, don't accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. They are to be put to death. So one reason God demands a life back is it's a punishment. What you're talking about is justice here. That's justice, right? It's It's an equal exchange for what one has done. 
Now, also, there's another reason to put somebody to death here and to take their lives, that God would allow that, is to purge the source of evil. Deuteronomy 17, 7 says this, The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. Now, notice, they didn't put this type of surrendering of life off to the side. The community was involved so they could see that certain crimes bear certain punishments. So yeah, it was a punishment. It's also a deterrent against others. And in doing so, it would purge the evil from society. Some people, by the way, are so consumed by evil and their acts are so terrible that according to the way the rabbis say it, they have forfeited the right to live. So the example also from ancient Israel, right? Right. Help me with this. You know, they come into the promised land and God says, you know, get rid of the folks around you because they're going to influence you one way or another in your generation or the next generation and you're going to end up doing evil things. Right. And so people would say, God allowed Israel to slaughter the Canaanites. Well, yeah, that's great if you're Bible illiterate, but if you've actually read the Bible, you realize that God said, these Canaanite tribes have become so evil, they have surrendered their right to live. So now, Israel, I'm going to use you as a tool in my hand to execute my justice on those wicked people. And so they went in and they dispatched the Canaanites, and sadly, they didn't completely, and we saw what happened the evil began to spread among Israel. Had they eliminated it, those influences would not have infected Israel. But, interestingly enough, God says, eh, you know, as for those nations on the periphery, on the outside of this promised land, all y'all just leave them alone, okay? Don't touch them. If they go after you now, you can go back and you can deal with them, but you just leave them alone. He was using them as a tool in his own hand. Well, justice for evil, I mean, that's God's order, right? As you are a student of the Bible, you see that. But society just pays no attention, and evil is running really rockshot over everything today. Right. And in order to execute justice, God uses some means. He uses the courts. God is the only one who is morally perfect to execute perfect justice. But he has delegated that ability to judge to humanity, and so he uses courts. In order to do that, what has he given them? He's given them laws. He's given them commands. If you're going to execute justice my way, this is how you do it. And for example, you have to have two to three witnesses at the very least. It has to be a quick judgment, not prolonged. You're not even allowed to let a person who's guilty go unpunished. And if you tolerate evil, it will only promote more evil. Psalm 12 says, you, Lord, will keep the need safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. Evil spreads, so it has to be dealt with swiftly and surely. Isn't that interesting? God used Israel to get rid of the Canaanites because there was an infection in that society that also threatened to spread to other societies. God was using Israel as a disinfectant at the time. Well, this is what I've always made a case for because I do believe that when evil spreads, when there is no resistance, and that's why it's so important that good people stand up and say things and resist evil because if you don't, look out. Evil has no qualms about using force to exert itself. So therefore, force must be met with force. That brings us to the third thing God says we can use is self-defense. Now, this is interesting. Exodus 22 says, if a thief is breaking into your home at night and you strike him in defense and kill him, you're not held liable. Good. But it says, if he's breaking into your house in the daytime and you do the same thing and kill him, you're liable. Why? In the dark, you couldn't see him. You don't know where you were hitting. But in the light, you can see him. Therefore, you're held liable. It'd be like the guy who's attacking you with a gun and you pull your concealed carry weapon and shoot him. Well, then you're not held liable. Now, you have to go through a whole lot of rigmarole. But if the person turns and runs, you're not allowed to shoot him in the back. You are liable. You are held liable. Mm -hmm. See, God has already got these bases covered here. Okay, here's another one. Even manslaughter. What happens if you take a life inadvertently? God says, you know, it doesn't matter if you hit him with an axe head that slips off the handle, or you drop a rock inadvertently on him, or you even hit him by accident with your hand. It's not the object, it's the motive. Did you do it on purpose or not? And that really starts to lead us into the gun control issue.
you. And so when we come back, that's where we're going to start. We're we, going to we, talk we, about the guns and the gun control issue. Hi, this is Pastor Jay Christensen, your truth barista. I want to thank you for coming here to High Beam Ministry. And in this ministry, we have a plethora of great things for you to explore. Obviously, you're listening to this podcast, and we want to thank you for that. But hey, sidle on over to the other page and check out the Frothy Thoughts blog. And we have a new thing coming, a book. It's called Frothy Thoughts from Your Truth Barista, and it's the first cup. And we'll have more books coming throughout this year based on our blog. Plus, you're going to enjoy some new teachings we'll be posting on the Feasts of the Lord and their prophetic significance with Jesus' first and second coming, and a wonderful video study on the book of Daniel. So those teachings will be coming up this year as well. So we want to invite you to contact us at highbeamministry at gmail.com if you have any questions. Love to answer them. But just keep coming back, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the articles. You'll be notified when new material drops. Thanks for joining us. Somebody can be killed by accident or in the heat of emotions, but it's not really the object used, it's the motive behind it. And that brings us to the gun issue. What is a gun? It's a piece of milled metal, an assembled metal. It is an inanimate object. And I don't know about you, outside of the cartoons, I have never seen a gun leave a house and go kill somebody all on its own. Absolutely. Okay, Over there are swords, there are spears, there are knives, there are all of these weapons are inanimate objects. Unless somebody is actually driving a tank and firing it, it's just a really big paperweight, okay? Cain used a rock. In Genesis, in the book of Judges, Yael used a tent peg to kill a commander. Okay, These inanimate objects can't and never will act on their own, so that makes them neutral. So tell me, what makes a gun evil? Nothing. Nothing. It's only how it's used and why it's used that makes the act evil or good. The spotlight really rests on the person. Do you want a really cool example? Mm -hmm. Okay. God is punishing the Israelites because of their sin, so snakes are biting them. What Mm. was his solution? Moses makes the image of a snake and puts it on a pole. God says, you look at the pole and you will live. That's what happened. They got healed. Well, they didn't use it as a one-time thing as it was intended. In fact, Israel preserved it, and within a couple of hundred years under King Hezekiah, these people were now worshiping the thing that saved them as a good thing, but they're now worshiping it, which made it now a bad thing. It was an idol. Hezekiah had to destroy it. See, an inanimate object is not a moral agent, a thing that can make right or wrong decisions. Giving a moral will to an inanimate object is delusional at best. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? And deceptive at worst. Why? To demonize an object is creating a reason to take it away in order to achieve an end. Now you have the other side of the gun control argument. See, the core of this whole argument, as I see it in the Bible, is not the item itself, not the object itself, but the person using it. But the argument from the side that wants to take away the guns says that, yes, it's an inanimate object. All we're doing is we're taking a dangerous instrument away from innocent people who may use it inappropriately. But in doing so, you're also taking it away from people who are innocent who have the right and the ability to use it properly. But those are the people who are the sacrifice. They have to sacrifice that, what you just said, to be able to take away the evil See, and that's a false argument because you're making people sacrifice unnecessarily in order to achieve your personal ends. What if I went out and I said, you know something? I saw that drunk driver down there who happened to be on that side of the political spectrum, and he deliberately ran down somebody who ticked him off in a road rage incident. So therefore, all you liberals out there must surrender your cars because I don't trust you with those cars. It was the car's fault. Mom, you had to call in the wrong gear. It's the same type of argument. And they would say, oh, we can't do that because he did it all by his own volitional self, by his own will. Well, gun argument, hello, same thing. 
It amazes me since you raised that question about alcohol. Alcohol, driving and drinking kills a lot of people, yet alcohol is never put into law that you can't have it. Right. Isn't that interesting? And it's like somebody kills somebody as a drunk driver, so we need to have alcohol control. We live in a world where car crashes have become the leading cause of death among teenagers. And alarmingly, in just 2014 alone, 17% of the 16 to 20 year old drivers involved in fatal crashes were in fact drunk. You never hear that come up. Never. Okay, somebody is, I, I just heard today, a young man just killed another person on the roads because he was texting and hit the car in front of him at, that was stopped at a light at 63 miles an hour. Okay, do you hear, let's take away phones from everybody, let's take away cars from everybody. No, they're saying, what do they do? You must learn how to use the phone and the car properly. There you go. Why can't you do the same argument about guns? Because it's not about guns, it's about people control. That's where this is headed. Now, a gun can be used for evil, murder, or good, self-defense. So managing guns in a reasonable society is about teaching or training. Now, what about registering guns? Well, that can be a good and a bad thing, right? You want to know who's got guns, etc., and whether they're sane to use them, etc., etc. But that can be a slippery slope. That's open for debate. That's in the middle ground. If we start removing guns, now you're that's very dangerous because you can have some people who have force and others who don't have force. And now we're getting into the human nature of will they use that force against those who can't defend themselves? Now you have a potentially dangerous problem. So what this really comes down to is it's not gun control, it's self-control. It's not about an inanimate object, it's about people right? Gun control. Hey, it's really easy to do. Let's just take away all the guns like they did in Australia. And you watch the crime rate skyrocket. You put heavy gun restrictions in Chicago and Washington and New York, and you watch the crime go up. The city with the strongest gun laws in our nation is Chicago. And Chicago is a disaster. It's a total disaster. But yet you look at some states that have open carry laws like Wyoming and Arizona, and gee, for some strange reason, the crime rate goes down. Those are facts that you can look up and see for yourself. So really, it is an issue of people, of self-control. Our founding fathers recognized the need for people to defend themselves against a rogue and armed government when it gets out of control. Why? They understood human nature. But I have a friend on Facebook who argued the opposite. Okay. That the Founding Fathers actually had the Second Amendment put in because of the fact that of what you just said, to defend against a rogue government. But today, so much has changed that nobody with guns is ever going to fight against the U.S. military who's going in a rogue fashion. He said it just is not reasonable nor logical to try to fight against a government like that. So it's changed. Well, it's not relevant. Well, yes, it is relevant because you're removing somebody's ability to defend themselves to the best of their ability. So if you have a rogue government that comes against people with tanks, don't you remember Tiananmen Square, the young man that stood the tank off? Okay, he stood there and dared the tank to run over him. Could the tank have done so? Yes, but look what he inspired. So even the act of self-defense is enough to make the attacker second-guess themselves. And by the way, I can tell you this, people in a rogue government don't live in tanks 24-7. So if a rogue government starts to get out of hand and threatening the people, you better believe that those people should be able to defend themselves in any way they can, and they will, by the way. But you have a lesson from history that basically says this is where these dictatorships all started from, was when they de-gunned the society. Yeah, when, when what did Hitler do the first time? He disarmed the people, and then he was able to run roughshod. Stalin, Ma all of these dictatorships, the Turks versus the Armenians in the early 1900s. First thing they did was disarm the Armenian populace and then murdered two to three million of them. So what is the what is the point you're trying to make if if there had been guns in Germany, my, there might not have been a Holocaust? My, my point is they were that was only one of the countries that I mentioned. There were a number of countries where tyranny reigned and before it happened, they disarmed the people. That was the point. Noah Webster said 
when he was talking about tyranny, that the people of America would never suffer tyranny because they are armed. So really, uh, the sad part about this is it's not about gun control. They want gun control for people control. That's really the ultimate aim on many of these people, and they're the ones who are stoking the hysteria against these terrible inanimate guns that get up and just shoot people. Or if we just kept them out of the hands of everybody, it'll be safe. Yeah, we should make more laws. It worked for meth and heroin, right? (laughs) Yeah. Good point. Here you go. What it comes down to is it's not gun control, it's self-control. Gun control is easy, but potentially dangerous. People self-control is tough, but it's infinitely safer. If somebody has self-control, the gun issue is no longer an issue. Let me tell you a very cool insight I learned from Dennis Prager, radio personality, right? He said, here's the difference between the liberal left mindset and the conservative right mindset. The liberal mindset asserts that evil comes from the outside. If you get rid of poverty, that will solve the problem of people in poverty doing evil things. So if you get rid of guns, then you'll have a utopia. So if you correct the outside, you'll have utopia. The conservative mindset is that evil is is inherent. It comes from within. So if you change the inside, then society becomes right and just. And by the way, that happens to be the biblical view. Therefore, even if one bans guns, evil people will find them and use them, or they'll find some other weapon to fulfill their goals. See, that's the issue. If you want to control all evil people, you can reduce them down to nothing, and they will still think evil in their hearts. And given the opportunity, they'll do evil. It is impossible to keep a gun away from somebody determined to get one. The most moral question you can ever ask is what works. Feeling good about a policy means nothing. Having good intentions means nothing. How do you stop people who are prepared, are willing, in fact desirous of dying from killing? And God knows. And God wrote about how evil begins, and it begins within the heart. That's right. why Jesus came, right? He right. came to change the inside so there is an outward evidence right. of it. Exactly. Jesus said, you've heard it said that you shouldn't murder. And he says, well, let me tell you where murder comes from. It comes from the inside. If you change the inside, the outward murder thing kind of just fades away, right? Same thing with the gun issue. The panic over this gun control thing today is unnecessary, it's counterproductive, and it's a mixed bag. Those with fears are being driven by those who have these ulterior motives. What do they want? If you look at the people who are pushing gun control, you will find most of them are on that left side of the spectrum who are either stupidly altruistic, meaning I hope that if we get rid of guns, society will be made perfect. Or they want to get rid of the guns so they can now have the only force to make people submit to their will. And that's where I see the problem. And they don't have a gun control problem. They have a self-control problem. And those are the ones to be concerned about. Government leaders are supposed to protect people, and that includes our right to self-protection. This is why the original founders called these God-given rights. rights. That's called inalienable rights. In other words, they're given by God. They cannot be taken away by man. So at the end of the day, because there's so much heated debate on both sides, emotions are completely out of control. Emphasis has really gone out the window. What advice do you give to folks now? Okay. For those of us who are concerned, if we see a person who is a potential problem like this troubled shooter down in Parkland, well, we need to be able to step up and deal with it before such things take root. There were so many things that they missed on this young man, and not just missed, ignored. The sheriff's department received multiple warnings about this kid. The school received multiple warnings. Society has to step up and be our brother's keeper to an extent to be able to short circuit these things before they actually take root and the bullets start flying. God has given us life and he allows us to protect it for him. So therefore, yeah, we are our brother's keeper and it's loving to protect others and their right to protect themselves. So what it boils down to this, let's not lose sight that the core issue is not gun control, it's self-control and that 
only through the life-changing work of Jesus can somebody's life be turned around. And for those who use things in an unlawful way, those are the only ones who should be held accountable by the law, not the innocent. And that's what I have to say about this. You know, Truth Barista, I knew you could do it. I (laughs) knew you could put this into perspective that everyone could understand. And now I want you to exert some espresso control and slide me another slug from that a wonderful job. Our culture is confused, and that confusion is spilling over into everything today. God is never confused, and those who know Him and obey Him are never confused. Confusion is a cause of not knowing the truth, but here on this program, we untangle our culture's confusion with the truth. Thanks for listening. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.